Good evening. We have a quorum. We'll call the planning board meeting to order. And first up for general information, Mr. Dwyer. That would be uh, Mr. Kozum. Hi, guys. Uh, I um, am looking to put a uh, farmer distiller um, for V1 on some land. I sent uh, um, a letter and a, a photo of the pro of the building that's uh, on North Branch Parkway, Meadow Road, um, to the east of the Hadley Town Dump. This is one of those agriculturally exempt um, micro money breweries or whatever it's called, Paul? Yeah, it's a 19C. Uh, when I started V1 17 years ago, they didn't have this license. I would say about a decade ago, maybe a little more, they started this farmer winers, farmer distiller, and farmer brewers license. Um, you know, where my current license to uh, import, wholesale, and distribute vodka in Massachusetts is uh, $10,000 a year. The uh, license for this farmer distiller's license is under 100. And uh, so they're really trying to promote local agriculture. And um, for the last decade, I've been growing spelt in Hadley, um, mostly by Alan Zahowski. Uh, so I have some growing right now, about two acres uh, off of Bay Road that I use in Poland for uh, my vodka. It's 100% made from spelt. So I would like to use that farmer distiller's license and open up um, something here in town. Okay. There's, there's no water, you know, of course, you know, there's no water there. You'll be putting in your own well. Yeah, I've, I've contacted, um, I actually got a quote from um, uh, Gila Her uh, Enterprises to run water from the um, the greenhouse there on Cemetery Road, it's 1,600 feet uh, to that property I'm looking at, uh, but it's really not cost effective. So I've spoken with three different well companies. One of them, don't quote me on the name of it, but he seemed like, well, he, he's done a lot of work in town, including some um, industrial uses, and he seemed uh, very confident. He said 99% he could go down between 250 and 300 feet below the bedrock and get, get water. Okay. Paul, as you know, it's uh, near the dump, uh, and that dump has been there for well as long as I can remember. That that's a long time. But so, I, I if I were in your shoes, I would have it tested. Or yeah, so I actually uh, the Freedom of Information Act. I uh, because there's some testing. Um, things that are done already by the town because uh, uh, I'm looking at property number two and property number three. So right, right to directly to that fence there. So um, I was waiting to hear from the DPW because they conduct tests there to see kind of exactly what's going on on that side. So I asked for that information last week. I, I guess I'm supposed to get 10 days to get that information by. And I'm also, you know, prior to closing or any of that stuff going to get the environmental on that land. So is any of the spelt being grown here or this is just the distillery? Uh, well, the whole point is to have the spelt grown on that location with the, with the distillation. So okay. uh, I would, it, it's the, uh, on two parcels, parcel number two is uh, 1.83 acres, parcel number three is 3.3 3 acres. So 5.13 acres for two parcels. Um, my, my current projection, I sent, sent you a picture of the building is 3000 square feet. So, uh, you know, I would say over four acres would be growing spelt all around the property. What do you, what do you grow? I mean, what do you distill it out of? Barley? So, wheat? Yeah. So mo most vodka is made from either corn, barley, rye, or wheat. And spelt is a wheat. It's uh, one of the ancient varieties. So it's very similar to wheat, but it has uh, some qualities in it that gives it a more mellow taste and, and flavor. So all the spelt that I've been growing in Hadley for the last decade is all organic. Alan, um, I work with Alan, we use no pesticides and that's kind of something that we're gonna propose location. The other thing is uh, when buying the land from uh, Joe Tchaikovsky, uh, he has uh, cherry trees across the street, fruit trees, blueberries, raspberries. So I'm going to be doing some local flavor 
proposed doing some local flavor infusions there also. Are you going to be buying it from Lenny Blighted too? Yeah. Yep. He, he was my first friend. Five, okay. Five years old. Yeah. Just a little. Yeah. So, so yeah. So Len, Lenny is the uh, 1.83 acres that's directly next to the dump, and then Joe's is next to his. So we, I both secured a deposit on both of them. You know, with the uh, understanding I get all the approvals and that the land isn't re really polluted. So, so I guess we're not going to be having a dog pound out here, huh? Well, the dog well, the dog pound is more east of that, Mike. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's the next one over. That's number five. So okay. that's to the east of that. So. So is there going to be any uh, customers coming there? Thing, uh, or yeah. Any? So yeah, Joe. So as part of this um, farmer distiller's license, I can have uh, a tasting room and sell bottles directly, uh, so that consumers can take them off off premise. Would you like to grow any more spelt than Hadley besides what you're growing now? So I'm probably going to need about, uh, depending, um, in the letter I sent to everybody, um, uh, we, we, we can do 15,000 liters of vodka a day in Poland. And, you know, again, I, I finished that in 2019. So this is not going to be anything uh, close to that. This is more for testing and for product development. But um, you, you use about three pounds for every bottle. So I'll definitely need more than the uh, three or four acres that I'm going to have growing. So I've already spoken with Joe and uh, Alan, you know, they're ready to do some more things. And, and the state's very obviously high on having, helping farmers, but also organic farming. Okay. Mr. Maximoski, I have a question for just, you know, this is what, what are we reviewing right now? I mean, if we say, yeah, that sounds great. Do we have another chance to say how much traffic are you going to have and things like that? No, he's agriculturally exempt, Mark. So he, this is he's coming to us as a matter of courtesy to let us know what's going on. Okay, but it's just it's just like the uh, the farm stands that were put up for for Barstow's and those guys. Um, they come to tell us what's going on as a matter of courtesy, okay. but the planning board really doesn't have much say in it. Well, as long he's just going to comply with state code for his process and sales. And of course, building code and plumbing code, those kind of things. And so Paul would come back to us just for like signage. That's it. That's about it. Yeah. So I think what we'd like to do, though, is uh, <clears throat> so the uh, farmer distiller is Chapter One Thirty Eight, Section Nineteen E, which allows the state to issue the license. But I think that uh, you also have to look at 40A section, uh, I forget what it is now, um, that sets out the agricultural exemption. And you'd want to be sure, in fact, let me just pull that up so I'm sure what I'm talking about. Uh, you'll, want to, you, you'll have to go through that formula to be sure that you, um, qualify under 40 A's for the for the agricultural exemption. Oh, for the certain percentage of products. Are you going to be selling any other products besides vodka? No, mm -mm. just V1 and V1 stuff. No, Bill, uh, if as you are aware that the neighbors wrote a letter uh, not too happy with the proposed dog pound, uh, what would be their route to uh, challenge the issuing of a permit, building permit? Would, would it be challenge the building inspector and then it'd go to the ZBA? Yeah, I think it'd be challenging the issuance of a permit, but uh, so, uh, Paul, the reference is Chapter 40A, Section 3, which sets up the uh, uh, agricultural, sets out the agricultural exemption. Um, although um, A was not updated because it talks about uh, sale of produce, wine, and dairy products. Um, so there's, there's a little disconnect between uh, 40A and 138. 
but uh, there is a kind of convoluted verbal formula in 40A section three that um, establishes what needs to be done uh, to, um, to qualify under the, uh, so it's worth having um, your lawyer look through that, help you parse through that and be sure that you are in fact eligible. Section 40, 48, section three, Bill? Yes. Okay, thank you. That's the, it's a very clumsy formula. And it's, part of it is wh whether you are using your own land. Part of it is whether you are using produce purchased elsewhere in Massachusetts. Um, and as I said, there's a disconnect because it talks about wine, but it doesn't talk necessarily about um, uh, distilleries. So you may qualify for the farm distillery under chapter 138, but not qualify for the agricultural exemption under chapter 40A. That's something that's going to, somewhere down the line, uh, someone's going to ask your attorney to prepare a zoning opinion. Um, so you might as well work that out, work through that now so you're sure. And then to your question, Joe, I'm not sure that there will be a, there certainly may not be a public hearing venue, um, but uh, uh, you know, I haven't looked through the, uh, to see whether the uh, ZBA has a role and might have a role in here. It is a bit further, it's uh, you know, a whole lot further west than the proposed dog pound so there's that yeah and when i when i look through the 138 the farmers distillers license it really uh, emphasizes using ingredients grown in massachusetts and of course where this location is it's been farmland for i don't know for many years so uh this is going to be farmer distiller's license and I can't get that license unless I show them that this is what this is used for. So I'll look into the 48. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Well, good luck, Paul. How, how should I proceed with all this? Come back with some of these findings or? Well, I mean, what, once you contact and get you find out exactly what you're exempt from, just kind of come back as a general information. Let us know what's going on. Okay. Very good. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Next up, Mr. Dwyer. Mr. Eiser. I can. Thank you. Um, is it possible to revisit the very small subdivision on North Maple Street that we talked about several weeks ago? Well, it was. You did bring it in late, so we we can quickly talk about it. But I hesitate to give it a, a yes or a no tonight because of that. Otherwise we're gonna have lead ourselves into what well, you did it for Randy. We would like to get the same courtesy yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. That's all. Understood. Okay. No problem. Okay. I'll just go over what I've done and then we can uh, meet again in, at your next meeting. Um, so all I did this time, I, I cut everything down to two minimum size lots. Uh, it's the properties in the aquifer, so we need 40,000 square feet. We need 200 feet of frontage uh, and 150 foot box to fit in, and all of that complies. So basically, I've got a little bit, about two acres worth of land to, between the lots and the road, and there's almost 18 acres that would uh, be restricted, conservation restriction, APR, whatever it would end up being. Uh, last time Joe asked about the land to the north. So that is owned by the Valley Land Fund. Uh, I didn't see anything where they had put it in an APR or anything, but if they own it, it's not going to go to developer. To the west is owned by Chang Farm. 
And that particular piece does not have any road frontage. So I don't anticipate that would be uh, built on in the future. So this would make a very nice, uh, big, bigger, uh, non-buildable area down there. Um, so I'm just curious to know if, since I've cut it down, I've talked to the, my client and they asked me to come back and see if you'd be willing to entertain two instead of three. So that's what this is all about. Unofficially, I like this one. You know, and unofficially, uh, this is kind of what the uh, very small subdivision was intended for. Yes, you could have, you know, the two lots and uh, you are dedicating a lot of open space. So we're still maintaining a significant amount of open space. And the other question, what is the, uh, the Valley Land Trust? Randy, is, that's not Kestrel or associated with Kestrel, is it, or a separate no, entity? No, it's, it's a separate entity. And I don't know, I don't know much about them. I know they exist, but it's not Kestrel. And they bought, I did, I noticed they bought it at foreclosure when uh, the young farm went out. Okay. Do, we have, do I have any other unofficial opinions? Well, two of the other two of the other members were in favor of the of the multi of the three lots, so I doubt they're going to be against the two lots. Okay. So then I will come back in two weeks and we'll discuss this officially. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a good night. Thanks, Randy. So um, Mr. Corbett's here for the, uh, the ZP battery, which we'll discuss in a moment. I, the only other person I have here is Jerome. Yes, hi. Hi, Ben. Hi. General question for the planning board, or are you with someone else? Um, the homeowner was supposed to be on here, um, as well as my um, engineering. But we can proceed if you want. And then if there's any additional questions, I can reach out to them. Oh, you're the administrative review for the uh, 11 Grand Birch Meadow. Meadow. Yes. Okay. Want, want to take the uh, Kelly, the, uh, yeah, the, what you call it, the map off here, whoever has it up. Oh, okay. Can we, we see you so we know where, Jerome, can we see you as long as you're closed so we know where we're talking to? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on. You know, I, Thank you. Hello, hello. Um, so the administrative review is uh, next on the agenda, and that means we have nobody else um, for questions. Um, okay. No. Yeah, we can talk about the administrative administrative review because that's not set at a particular time. So it's just once the meeting opens, so we can go yep. with that. Well, I had it down uh, for under the public hearings and at 645 anyway, so uh, we're all okay. set. Yeah. Well, it's 650, so we're all set anyway. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, that is admin review, Wilga. Uh, Levin Birch Meadow. Let me see what I have from this. That was a ground mount uh, solar. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Small scale. All right. So I know we had plans sent to us. Yes. A and, whole bunch of them. <laughs> and um, 
I would bring some of them up, but I'm apparently I didn't download to my waiver folder. So um, who would I have? Who would have sent the uh, plans in? Um, I sent the uh, ones electronically, and um, the homeowner actually dropped off the physical. Okay. So what if you email? Want... What email did that come from? Uh, let me check. Double check that. Hold on. And what? Date was that? Probably his. Yes, yeah, most likely from me, Jerome. A at Empower Energy. Co, and that should have been sent on our last meeting. I think it was January four. Okay. Yep. I got you here. Okay. And I'm going to download these now and directions. Permits, solar, admin review. Okay. So we'd probably like to look at the ground mount plan set. Well, I'll get all four of them up. So let's see. Uh, might as well start with pre design. Oops, that didn't work. There, so this was the pre-design, which is a two-page document showing where the field is going to be in relation to the house. Correct. And just a couple of other variations on that, I guess. Yeah. So let me see if I can get it. There, that's a little more manageable. And the next item was the horizon report. I'm not sure what that was. Um, these are actually the drone pictures of the um, area. <clears throat> Okay, so these panels will barely be visible from any street. Is that correct? Correct. So if you see right there where the van is, um, that's to the right of that van. That's where the um, proposed ground mount will be. Okay. These are going to be the tiltable ones. They're going to be fixed. 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 Well, actually, there should be a plan set here that indicates that. Hold on. Okay. These are going to be sitting on metal poles, drop stuck into the ground. Correct. Correct. Standard. Okay. Okay. So it I... will be. There'll be a tilt on it. There'll be what? There'll, there'll be a tilt. Be oh, slow. yeah. Okay. And one of the documents I sent you actual is the actual plan set of the ground mount. Okay. Like doing it that way. So let me try that again. And that's all going to net 
metering or is there going to be any battery storage or um net metering the customer does have an option for battery storage in the future but he did not choose that at this time <clears throat> so this shows the the tilt which is a mm -hmm. relatively modest Twenty twenty degrees. Yes. And what are the length and width dimensions of the? I didn't see that. I think it's in the first page of the actual array. Um, it doesn't seem to have a. Unless it's in the design yeah, over here. Overall beam length is 33 feet. Uh, let me see. 34 foot nine. Yeah, 33. Nine. I can't, okay, 33 something. Um, overall array east west dimension, 34 nine. Yeah. And what was the north south dimension? I'm looking right now. Oh, it's a six by five. Yeah, probably somewhere around 20 feet. Yeah, I can get the exact measurement from the um, design team. But yeah, it's approximately around 20. What's the size of each panel? Um, it's right there on module size. Underneath the model mo module model is so it's 40.87 inches by 69 inches. Okay. Okay, so it's three and a half by just about six. Yeah. Three hundred fifty watt mod modules. <clears throat> yes, okay. three fifty. Okay, and there's one more set look at so get rid of that and then that's a uh, cabled underground and comes up to an inverter on the house yes or? yes on the next plan set that you'll see there'll be a trench huh. to go from the ground mount to the house are these have micro inverters or single or just a just a set of inverters set of inverters okay just curious. <clears throat> Just out of curiosity, why not micro inverters of each one? Um, for this one, the customer chose um, a particular brand. And for this brand, it's just uh, one inverter, Solar Edge. Okay. But there was an option if they wanted to go with the micro inverter. So looking at this, and if I can get my mouse there, if you could just see it as a little crosshair, and that's roughly where it's going to be. Correct. So potentially the only person who is going to have to look at it is the neighbor across the street Correct. or anyone else who, well, maybe one other house can see it, but generally it will be out of the way. Correct. All right, let's see. Um, you'll be surrounded by a fence. Do they so, have, to have a fence? So that's my question for you guys. Um, does the town require the fence? Or, no. okay. Town so, does not require we, the fence. Okay, so if that's the case, we can um, do it without the fence. Yeah, because it's going to be high enough to mow underneath and keep it neat and clean. Correct. Yeah. 
I was going to I was going to ask why the fence because I mean unless the, unless the homeowner wanted it, but it's not required. Yeah, so uh, most towns um, that we've had ground mounts in um, does require fence um, security fence. So yeah. when we the plan set was put together, automatically they put a fence. Yeah. But we do have a second um, plan set that shows no fence. Yeah, I mean if this was a large ground mounted solar array, would be we would require a fence. But for small homeowners type, we don't require it. Great. That's a less cost for the homeowner. They'll be happy about that. Well, it's easy to maintain too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And here see how is, grassy that area is. Here is the trench. Yep. I'll accept that as being fine labeling. Um, In, primarily the reason for this particular hearing was that so people would not set it adjacent to the to the street so it would impede sight visual impairment you know getting in and out of your driveway etc but this is far enough back so no problem yeah. perfect okay so uh let me go through the checklist Uh, it's been sent out for interdepartment review to the Building Inspector, Conservation Commission, Fire Department, and Police Department. Correct. Um, and that was, let's see, uh, Jim, that was sent probably like the day after the. Uh, oh, yeah, that was sent a couple of days after. Well, well, well it, was this, it was sent more than 35 days before this meeting. Okay. Probably close uh, to 40. We're within time to do the, our decision. Um, got the right number of documents. Uh, the plan shows everything required by the bylaw. Um, we have the solar system specs, uh, electrical diagram, Contact information. Um, and it's not a tower here, so that's not applicable. So the electrical schematic. Um, it's not building mounted, so we don't need that. Um, uh, uh, insurance that would, um, the owner has site control. Um, do we have any documentation? What it's what stage in the uh, process do you notify the utility that um, you're going to be? connecting um we've already started that process it's an uh, interconnection okay. um application very early on mr dwyer that's done okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there will be no clearing here um uh, we don't need wildlife corridors without a fence and um Setbacks 50 feet from the nearest property line. I would say so. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well about well beyond 50. Okay. So that satisfies all the checkoffs on the administrative review. Yay. So, so what's the next step? The vote. We will vote. <laughs> make Mr. Dwyer make a motion. We'll vote. And uh, there's no appeal period, so you can go right down to the building inspector and do whatever's next. 
Perfect. I'll, I'll make a motion to grant administrative approval. Second. Okay. A motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? The motion passes unanimously. Um, you're going to get that motion on, Mr. Dwyer. You want me to do that? Um, sure. I have a, a sort of a simplified version of it that I'll okay. send you. Okay. Uh, but okay, that's fine. Uh, so that'll go out to the building inspector for the next couple of days. Um, in the meantime, he's we can if you if you go for it, say you go there tomorrow. Just let him let him know that he could contact Bill and myself if he wants to. The official word that it was approved, and you can proceed. Whenever you want to proceed with the Actually, town. Don't be in a rush. He's on vacation. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, it's not it's not on the calendar to be installed yet. So we have a yeah. little time here. Yeah. I mean, you got quite a few uh if there's anything I, I got a solar on my house. I got two ah, okay. I have two systems, one eight years ago and one last year. So yeah, as you well know, there's a mountain of paperwork to get this through. Oh yeah. Multiple departments. <laughs> well, is that it, gentlemen? That's it. That's it. Perfect. Thank you so Good much luck. for your time. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Mr. Dwyer. That would be the public hearing for ZP Battery. Okay. The, uh, I guess you're they're requesting in a well. This is a continuation of the uh, public hearing on a battery and everything was, was pretty much all set for that project, except to get an opinion from town council if it is indeed a permitted use. <clears throat> and as you know, we got an official an a, official opinion from town council and it is not in compliance with our zone bylaw for solar arrays. So um, the applicant, I believe is requesting an extension so that they can review it with their attorneys which is fine no problem and the next step for us would be to decide if we want to propose something at the annual town meeting to amend the zone article on solar to allow batteries but in the meantime we can take up you have something to, to, to uh you want you want to talk about it to mr corbett uh, I was just going to sign on here. Uh, Bill had mentioned uh, maybe discussing about a little bit around that amendment. Um, and I had some input, so I said I'd sign on in case you guys wanted any input. Okay, that's fine. Um, I'm sure we'll grant your request for an extension. But in the meantime, I mean, I don't have any opinion one way or the other to pr propose to permit uh, or not permit batteries separate from a solar battery site. What I would like to do is have each of us do some serious research to find out pros and cons on battery, simple on plain battery storage sites for electricity. Um, because I just don't know if it's a good idea or not or a bad idea. I mean, I, I know there's some good ideas about it. Um, I'm sure there's gonna be something out there opposing it, but you know, factually, what may not be good about it or what is factually good about it. So um, we need to find that out. I, and it I think would, it be a, would it be as simple as amending the solar bylaw regulations? Because this is not nothing to do with solar at this point. It has to do with taking energy from the grid and storing it, which is not solar related. It, 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 I think it, would be, I think we would be amending the solar bylaw to allow this use. As a separate as a separate standalone batteries on the site, on a site rather. I think, site. I think Jim's point is well taken. Rather than try to come up with something rather quickly, I think we all have to do our due diligence and become better informed as members of the board before we put it before a town meeting too. So we've got to inform ourselves. So good suggestion. I see that we we are approving these anyway. <clears throat> We've approved several as um, as a supplement to a solar field. So it's not the question is not whether batteries belong in town or not. Uh, you know the uh, the fact is that they're here. So uh, I think it may just be as simple as 
uh, some de uh, definitional change um, to, to include these um, as if they were part of the so uh, solar, um, uh, solar energy development process. Yeah, and some insight on that if you'd like to. Uh, but go ahead, Mark. Sorry, just. No, I was just going to say, obviously, <clears throat> the argument for battery storage in general, for the environment and you know, you know, the, the energy network is, is strong, and it's just site-specific. How do we feel about it? And if, if we're going to allow it in sites where you couldn't you know, have the solar generation what does that mean i mean in your case you happen to put it out of of the way in in a gravel pit but could my neighbor put one up you know or you know could someone do it next to a, a school i mean you know there's just a lot of um i think in my mind without getting into the research end of it if it's connected to the generation then there's usually an open space um and it's often been separated from other uses just by the nature of where it's being put but um and that's just the first off the that's just my my first concern of that where can it go and do we need to amend that language if it's not directly connected to solar because I see Mike's point, you know, um, Eversource could start putting batteries all, all over town that they generated power from coal. So it's, uh, it's interesting safety and philosophical question that I think we have to grapple with. Yeah. to grapple over the aquifer protection district as well so yeah I, i'm not sure we even want these if it's going to be a large facility in the aquifer no many no matter how many precautions are taken as the, as the opinion said this is not to say that it wouldn't be allowed as an industrial or whatever the quote was there yeah, i mean that's why i'm saying we need to look yeah. at this Exactly. And do some research and find out some more information because, you know, we're, we're all, to be very honest, the five of us are shooting from the hip. Mr. Dwyer thinks his own, thinks it's a simple definition. I, we, some of us may agree or disagree with that. You know, we, we need to know what we're talking about is what it comes down to. Yeah, understood. So, like, I, I just give you a little insight. Um, so, I've been working with towns like yours. Um, throughout this permitting process. Yeah, can you name some of the towns? Uh... Yeah, absolutely. So right now I'm working directly with Lancaster, Mass um, on amending their solar bylaw um, for the addition of, it kind of to Bill's point, um, is we are amending their solar bylaw um, as this is a renewable energy um, and it's it's because of the solar. So it's, it's coming in in the way that the state reg and the state program is written it is to absorb the solar energy that is on the three phase feeders currently so a lot of this has to come from the electrification of the grid and um, in, in working to utilize the renewable energy in which we have that we can't rely I can't go to a renewable energy uh, facility like a solar field and say I need that power right now at seven o'clock at night and turn it on like you can with a gas peaker plug or a coal peaker so the point of these battery systems is to come in on three phase lines that currently have solar. So typically in towns, we look at historically, where have you allowed solar um, and try to allow it in those zones, not saying that you have to allow a million of them in, in, in that zone, but just to be able to allow a battery to connect to an existing feeder that has solar on it already. Um, so that could come in a form of will allow it in this zone, but only say two systems can only be allowed in that zone or three, whatever makes sense for you guys as a town. Every town's different, um, every town's infrastructure. You, you said that you were working with other towns on this. You mentioned Lancaster, what are the yeah. other towns? 
So I've worked with Lank. I'm working with Lancaster currently. I've previously worked with Athol Mass. Um, we've worked with Charlton through our smart, smart portfolio um, to get batteries into their bylaws as well. Um, and Southbridge as well. I've, I've been talking, well, I've already been projects in there, um, but we've discussed the this as a use in the bylaw prior to that. What's the life of a battery? Uh, right now, you're seeing about 20 years on batteries. Um, and oh, wow, that to, long? Yeah, yeah, about 20 years on the, on the lithium iron phosphate technology, uh, or the chemistry, rather. Um, some of the heavier metal ones, they're, they don't last quite as long, maybe 15 years, um, but generally speaking, about 20 years. So how many towns in Massachusetts or and or cities have these type of battery storage facilities now so that right, are drawing from the grid? So right now, you don't have them implemented as a standalone system. This is a new program in the state. This is a directive from the governor's office and the higher ups um, to, to get ready for offshore wind. And that's really what it's all about at the end of the day is, is making making sure that that power from Martha's Vineyard can get throughout the state of Massachusetts. And that's, that's, that's the long-term goal of this process. But right now we're at, we're at the SREC one phase of batteries, if you put it in solar terms. Um, but did Eversource approach you or did you approach Eversource or not? Or we submit an application. It's, it's, a, it's a generation application, just as a solar application is. Um, and, they, and they review it and through their, their whole process as, as if it was a solar field, essentially. It's a battery storage. So they look at it as a generator. It's not considered anything else besides a generator. Now, I mean, all batteries leak. You even get your dry cell, your, your, your AAA batteries, for example, do leak. Do, I'm assuming these batteries would leak as well if something happened to them. Battery doesn't really have anything to this type of battery, I should say. The, the lithium iron phosphate that we, we're using doesn't doesn't have anything that would potentially leak. Um, it has a small amount of electrolyte in it that makes it so the protons can go back and forth. Um, nothing detrimental to any water runoff um, that's been fully tested and vetted through um, multiple third party um, people. Um, and there are systems that, so in going back and talking about the aquifer, there are abilities to do air-cooled systems instead of liquid-cooled systems, in which I'm doing here in this case. Um, I know we've talked about liquid-cooled, but we've beat ourselves up about internally about that, and just not worth the, the end of the day, it's not worth it for anybody. Um, so there, there is still options to do air-cooled systems um, out there. Um, it's just becoming more of an outdated technology, but a lot of your older technology with your heavy metal batteries, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a hazard there with, with a spill. Um, I say spill, but they say that there's a fire and you have a massive amount of water getting put on. There, there's hazards there with heavy metals being introduced to the water for sure. Yeah, lithium is used for bipolar disorder too, which may help some of us on the board. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm not, looking for, I'm, not looking for any, I'm not looking for any confidential information on this question, Mr. Corbett, but on a solar system, how you get paid is pretty obvious, but how does the financials on a battery system work? It works the same way. Uh, the oh, it does. Yeah, the pro so this, instead of it being an SREC 1 program, an SREC 2 program, or the SMART program, this is the next step. So this, we're, we are in the clean peak energy standard now. So that, that program you get clean peak credits. So just like your solar field uh, with your SREC credits, um, you produce it during a time that you need it, you get better credits, however that may work. Um, with this system, if you, one, can co-locate co with a solar field, you can apply for the credits for that, um, or you can be uh, coincident where you're charging when solar is produced. Um, so that would mean that you'd have to be connected to a three-phase feeder that has solar production on it currently, and you would be charging during the window in which that so those solar fields are producing energy. Now, it's not foolproof. It's not to say that some power might be coming from a coal plant, but when you think of it in terms of electricity and water saying, I'm going to take this electricity from here, it's going to fill back up. So in the way that the program's written, the charge windows kind of dictate and kind of 
identify the fact that it's charging from solar. Granted, we all know that that proton's never the same even before it comes off of the solar side. So you will never be able to say that even the proton's coming from the solar side into the batteries that's on site, it's not the same. So it's never going to be a proof kind of situation where it's charging 100% um, from solar. But the way that it's written and the way that the state has guided the uh, industry into implementing the battery storage is that you're charging during times of solar production or wind production. And you're discharging while those two are offline. So if you had a if you had a solar system and a battery system, you could essentially, I hate to say, but it almost sounds like you could double dip. Um, the way that the program works is no on that because the solar would be coupled behind the meter um, of the solar production. Okay. The only letting out from the battery essentially at that point in time. Um, so there's no double dipping necessarily. I guess in a way you could kind of think of that as somebody else is making money and then you're taking that energy as well and then you're putting in the battery and putting it back in. But that is the purpose of the um, of the state. Um, so, so, so if you had so a battery, that's system, true. Excuse me. If you had a battery system and a solar, would you be would you get any more for it if you charge the batteries during the day and not put it into the grid and then let it go at night? That's when they would want you to charge the energy, and that's the point of the storage is to, is to put it in the grid when it's needed. Um, okay. I'm sure there's perks that go along with them. I wasn't too much involved with our smart portfolio, so I don't know the ins and outs of the economics there. Um, but I would think that you have an adder um, for having the battery. Okay. Massachusetts has, I believe, the second highest uh, electricity cost in the country behind uh, Hawaii. Will, will this bring the cost of electricity down, or is, is it irrelevant? It's not going to help. I think that's higher than us but i mean that was that what we were told with the solar right uh, from the start um but i think long term wise that that's that's a reality um whether the edc's like national grid or eversource actually implement that into their billing uh, is a whole other story but the goal is to even <laughs> make it more efficient be able to use the renewable energy that we've developed over the past 10 years efficiently and more responsibly and put it back into the grid in times in which we can actually utilize it. Uh, so we're not buying electricity at a high demand price from ISO New England at 11 o'clock at night while it's five degrees out in the middle of winter when we can push on the solar field. Um, Any idea what other states have these type of batteries that are sucking electricity off the grid? New York is, is very far ahead of us. Uh, they have it within the inner cities. Um, we're here talking about in the middle of a woods, you know. They have these things in buildings and parking garages. You yeah. Know, next housing. Um, the partners are heavily involved with a lot of development out in New York right now, and that's what they're seeing. Um, California. Yeah, battery California. storage out there. But there's, there's plenty of battery storage here in Massachusetts currently right now, too, to get back to that. I know that was brought up a little bit. What you'll see right now is... Most of the municipalities in the state, um, they have had an opportunity in the past to be part of programs to add batteries to their substations or their infrastructure, wherever they see fit, to even out their grid. And that's almost like a pilot program for our bigger national grid and Eversource infrastructure um, in Sterling, Mass. And we've had one, we've had a battery, uh, two megawatt battery next to our substation for about going on eight years now. We were one of the first in the state. Um, and that was through a pilot program and we can we can shut down our entire town and still run our police fire department um all of our safety features in the town um for 12 days without any electricity so but it, it wouldn't matter where these batteries were located it could be hadley it could be plainville it could be goshen williamsburg it wouldn't matter correct plainville is a great area but yes um it it, it it matters to a point where you're looking at areas with saturation of solar production, uh, which is what this program speaks to. This program speaks to feeders, three phase feeders that are almost at capacity because we've allowed so much generation on them. And the hopes is to have the batteries charging that solar so you can free up hosting capacities. So How do you know when you get the saturation with solar? Um, with 
national, I can't speak to Eversource. So there's a process in, for Eversource that you can submit a pre-application. They'll tell you what generation on the line. Um, so in this case, I believe there's for, well, I just say, so for Ridge Road anyway, there's five megawatts worth of solar on that feeder line. Um, so which is why we submit an application for five to Eversource. But with National Grid, they have this whole database online that I can actually physically see the of each feeder and I can click on it and it tells me how much solar generation is on it. Um, and then it gives you the deduction of that to tell you how much hosting capacity is left. So the goal of this program is to look at the feeders that are 70 to 80% there to help that infrastructure from needing upgrades. So the biggest part of this is the, the Eversource and National Grid are constantly upgrading their services because they don't, they don't engineer it from the start to begin with. But, so to explain it in a, in a simple term to people who are asking questions, uh, is this very similar to Northfield Mountain? Are you familiar with that? Not too familiar. I was just talking with um, a building inspector up in orange about this though um and he was familiar with it but we didn't get into the conversation too much about it but um they they pump the pump the water up to the hydro top. right yeah and yeah. then they release it when there's a demand uh and it's supposed to be a net saving of energy and uh the other the other thing you this is being sold as a uh kind of as a green party initiative but nevertheless I think a great analogy that Mark Dunn had was you're still shipping all kind of energy th through the grid and it's like that tanker filled with milk. Some of it has goat's milk. So you, there's going to be a small amount of goat's milk you're going to try to suck out if you're only going to do it for the, for the green yeah. energy. But it's going to be, like you said, for coal or natural gas or other things. And it's hard for, for boards like yourself to make that differentiation. Um, so it's that, not hard for me to make it, excuse me. It's not no, hard no, no, no. I'm just saying to, to make it so like, can you decide now that you don't want this because you, you know that there's coal coming into that power grid, but the, the way the program is written is so that you are charging during solar. And there's, believe me, National Grid, we've been working with National Grid for two and a half years on this. And they don't want us absorbing that energy. They don't want us absorbing that coal energy. The point of it is to absorb the renewables. So they only give us, so each project's different. This isn't like across the board, I can charge whenever I want. District. Yeah, well, I, I think project, so I have a couple, I have two questions or one question, one clarification. Part of what Dr. Zagrodnik was saying uh, was the, uh, the way uh, Northfield was designed to work was in conjunction with Yankee Atomic, which was in Brattleboro or Vernon, Vermont, Vernon. Yeah. with the idea that the uh, nuclear plant runs at a constant speed. So it's generating energy at night when no one wants it. And that's that was the other part of the idea of use that energy that would otherwise be wasted to, to pump the water up. But um, the question I had was, does the utility charge you? And you know, when I plug in my iPhone to charge, I am drawing from the grid and I get charged for what that, ever that incremental amount is. Do you get charged for what you take in from the grid or just what you give back to the grid? Yes, we get charged for everything that runs constantly and we get charged for what we take in and we get compensated on the way up. So you, you're basically, you're net metering just like Jim's house. Essentially, uh, to, to an extent. Uh, wholesale. He buys Jim Some Jim. projects can operate like that and some can't. Um, it gets very tricky in how these get set up. Individual projects can actually operate. Not all of them are the same. Um, each one is dictated by National Grid Resource as to how it can operate and at what percentage you can charge and discharge. So, I would think it'd be cheaper to charge the batteries at night because you're not using high price, price green ge generator electricity. C clearly, the cost of generating electricity from natural gas or other fuels is less expensive than solar. 
There is an option to there. There is an option to charge at night through wind hours uh, when that does come online. But right now, your cheapest electricity that you'll find is your solar production um, off of off of the three phase feeders. Uh, and that's what they're trying to capture is that cheaper production and discharging it back at a cheaper rate than a peak load um, demand charge from a peaker. Oh, I, I think the question you should have posed early on was not or, or had. Didn't, you shouldn't have proposed that this has something to do with solar, where it doesn't. Now you've got this debate going on. Rather, you should have come here and said, look, we want to put some batteries in. They're going to suck energy from the grid, period. That's, that's why we're here talking about it, too. Um, but the way that the program is written is that it's supposed to absorb solar energy. So that's, that's how we go. Well, who, who wrote the law? We appreciate the fact that you've share we've got we're way off of the zoning part of it but uh i'm happy to i'm happy to help you guys talk through these things so yep. what was the name of the program you we, mentioned SRAC and smart but now you said clean it's the clean peak energy standard clean peak energy these are all these are all things to learn about battery storage facilities i mean yeah. when, again we're off we're off with zoning yeah. article no well, doubt about it however we're trying to learn the pros and cons of battery storage. What, what, how does it work? Why, et cetera. So, and, you, know, you know, this is an educational thing right now. Yeah. And, you know, as soon as Amherst approves a dozen of these and Northampton approves a dozen, then I might be on board. I don't know. I see Nor Amherst is uh, putting a moratorium on solar fields because it just got out of control. No, they haven't done it yet. They're talking about it, but it's not going anywhere. Solar development in the state of Mass is dead anyway. Pardon me? Solar development, ground mounted, large scale ground mount solar development, there's zero incentive dead. in Massachusetts anymore. It's, a, it's essentially a dead industry right now, and everybody that's smart enough to do it is switching to battery storage. I go out to the Midwest, and it's a lot of uh, wind out there. They, they, it, it looks like uh, Palm Springs almost. Yeah, that'll be Martha's Vineyard shortly. Oh. About 10 miles off, there's about 1,800 megawatts worth of offshore wind going in, in the next two years. About $4 billion worth of projects. Jesus. It's crazy. But that's, that's what's leading up to this energy storage situation in the state. And that's, that's it, it's actually a need, not versus not a want. Um, in order to have that offshore wind, in order to make all that viable, you have to have battery storage. So you're going to see all of those, um, all the coal plants right now, they're all decommissioning them over the next however many years they have left to live, and they'll be putting those full of batteries, and those will be battery peaker plants. Let me ask you something. Let's assume every battery storage facility was located in, say, Texas. Everything. How difficult or is it inefficient to then draw the energy from Texas here? Or does it, yeah. what, yeah. what's the dissipation? So, so if you wanna, yeah, I can explain that a little bit. So say we have offshore wind in Martha's Vineyard, right? And it gets injected in Brayton Point uh, down in Southeast Massachusetts. At yeah. first point of connection, there's gonna be probably 500 megawatts worth of batteries there. And then follow the transmission line up 10 miles, 20 miles, there's gonna be another 100 megawatt worth of batteries there and 100 megawatt, throw a softball. Keep throwing a softball and that's how you get it to where it's going, you have to store it along the way. And you can't go too far without storing it because you lose your ramp rates and you lose your energy. So yeah. you have to store it along the way into all these bigger injection points throughout the state and then have battered smaller systems within the infrastructure of towns in order to distribute that energy at an effective way. So that's what we're gonna be seeing over the course of the next 10, 15 years here in Massachusetts is battery going everywhere. So this is kind of like Mao Zedong, you know who he was, right? He wanted a, he, huh? he wanted, he wanted a uh, iron smelter in every backyard and we know what happened with that. Yeah. You, it, the right. what when, you start, when you start transmitting electricity, you start losing this line loss. Exactly. The higher the voltage transmission, the lower the line loss. So right. you start seeing some of these high voltage lines 
in approaching a million volts transmission because the line loss is lower as the voltage increases. As the voltage yeah. decreases, the line loss is greater. Larger so it gets very complicated. Yeah. And the line loss, the voltages get extremely high. Therefore, there's presents another problem. Yeah, for a private developer, they'll only let you hook up to a maximum of 115 kV. Um, but you're seeing Eversource down Southeast Mass um, actually doing 345 kV infrastructure, stepping it down to 115, putting the batteries there and stepping it back up. Um, yeah. Interesting in how the industry works. There's, a, there's many facets to it, and it's pretty wild. So what's Rhode Island doing? Or, or uh... Uh, They'll be doing batteries pretty shortly, too, along with Connecticut, because there's yeah. injection points for offshore wind going there as well. So it's all becoming a thing, and the whole Northeast is is going to be the poster child for uh, battery storage and green efficiency. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Corbett. You've been very helpful yeah, and a lot. on yeah. a lot of different things. You know your stuff. Anytime. Yeah. Anytime. Okay. So I will make a motion to continue to March fifteenth at six forty-five. Second. Motion a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Comia. Mr. Comia, there you are. Hi, board. How are you? Good. Pretty good. Um, so I think... I don't know, Bill. Is do you want to use this time to discuss those conditions or how to maneuver through I, them? Or? I, I just got those out this okay. afternoon, so um, I don't. I just wanted to get them floated out, and I may change it. I did not integrate some of the extra conditions from your draft. Um, I'm just trying to just trying to kick it along a little bit. So uh, no, I don't think there's anything to discuss except I. I hoping everybody thinks it would be a good idea to have standard conditions so that if nothing else, I don't have to spend an extra 15 minutes reading off all of those conditions, which have to be in the decision because if they're not in the decision, someone will try to do something that they should. No, I, I think it's a good idea to have standard conditions for everything that we do. And that does make things a lot more clear i would say it makes it more clear but it makes it makes reading of the motion faster yeah but i we're gonna say i was impressed with the fact that bill had standard conditions that he read off to make it simpler would be even better yeah yeah i i think the way in when we when we were discussing this at the last meeting um you know if if the board is to adopt this as a policy similar to accepting items up to Friday um, that you would in your public hearing when it came time to render a decision say and ask you know and talk about you know any specific conditions that you would apply to the the decision uh, of approval um, and then also include and standard conditions um, because you would have already adopted that so I think um, you do have an, a, a know-how of how to go forward, assuming that those are the conditions that you'd want to apply to every decision. Um, so with that said, um, so this is a first stab at kind of looking at the special permit section. Um, it's, um, I think as you, and I didn't know necessarily how to approach it. So the way that I usually approach when, a board is asking about, you know, trying to amend their bylaw or look at how a certain aspect is is addressed within the bylaw to try to do as, as uh, a cursory like diagnostic of it. And so what I did, um, and I'm just gonna share my screen. Oh, Let me enable that. Thanks, Bill. Um, is the best that I could was to um, 
was to look at how special permits are addressed within your zoning bylaw. Um, and I would say that generally, oops, um, you have the specific sections where special permits are required, um, but I wanted to ensure that because some boards establish a special special permit section within the administration section of the bylaw, um, you do address it, but I think that there may be some confusion of the way that it is presented word-wise, um, specifically as a power of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Elsewhere, you say that the Planning Board serves as a special permit granting authority um, for other permits, as you are aware, because you issue special permits. Um, but just some, some cursory items. And, and I guess, you know, one of the one of the next steps from this is to establish how you want to move forward. Um, is it a bylaw amendment to address possibly looking at special permits as its own section within the administration section of your bylaw? Um, and then also how to incorporate general findings as well as um, how it's alluded to elsewhere in the bylaw, specifically um, if you're addressing um, standards and criteria in, and I think I, I draw attention to this, um, removal of earth products. Within your section nine, where you discuss this, there are no requirements, standards, or findings. It suggests that you need a special permit to remove earth. Um, I think typically there would be an understanding too that, that one would need to file some sort of site plan um, however, it's not quite clear. Um, same with uh, uses in the aquifer protection district. Um, the planning board is allowed to issue a special permit um, for uses there um, as it would deem um, appropriate. Um, so I think how I generally presented this is to look at um, what could appear in the administration section. And that is literally an establishment of what, how a special permit um, goes through its process. It would also include right here um, specific findings, because I know the board issues findings when it goes through the process of um, the decision um, that would be specific for every special permit. Um, as you're aware, the marijuana section, um, how you address cannabis in Hadley, as well as solar, you have specific findings in those sections. Obviously, you would include them in the decision. Um, and they're included in those sections of the bylaw because it makes sense there and alluded to as additional findings for a special permit. Um, but these are general for those special permits that don't necessarily have findings. Um, but the planning board or the ZBA would issue special permits. Um, but um, I think generally how I've seen it in, in other communities is, is just that, that there's a establishment of a special permits kind of general language in the administration section, not to mention um, um, uh, providing the powers of the planning board um, within that section. But I don't know if, you know, if the board had um, gotten to review this, um, but I guess, you know, th this is a time for, for me to learn um, if this is the approach that you're looking at, or if there are some specifics that, you know, you'd, you'd want to address within this um, deep dive into special permits. I like it overall. Uh, right now, our entire special permit section of the bylaw, where all, both the planning board and the ZBA are piggybacking off one paragraph in the um, section that defines the ZBA. Um, so I think we do need a uh, sort of a something in administration that covers both what the ZBA and the planning board will do. Um, and um, 
the only thing I, you know, just at, at, at a first pass through this, when you, where you have that list of findings, if you could, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to be making, uh, you know, what, nine or 10 findings in there, but it can add another section. Um, also any findings specific to the, um, article under which the special permit is authorized. But Bill and Ken, uh, the state statute has uh, special recommendations for a finding, for a special permit, and for a variance. And when Ken was referring to findings, that seems a little different than what the ZBA would recommend. Yeah, this is not a finding in the ZBA sense. This is, uh, these are, and maybe have, there's a, a better have, word for how it. Do, how, do we, how do we make it clear? In other words, some lawyer may read it and say, look, this is a, a finding that usually is issued by the ZBA, but- uh, Act of definitions? Yes. Well, I, I would would there would there be? I guess the question for the board is: Would there be any instance where the ZBA would issue a special permit, not reviewing? I feel like these are to maybe ones that are presented with site plans, um, because they have to adhere to the underlying zoning, and there is this question of how does it you know, how is it not detrimental to the neighborhood and alter the character, as well as, you know, some of those other various issues that are related to an actual construction of a building or a structure. Um, I don't know. And, and I, that's a good, that's a great question. Um, but maybe it's alluded to when you are actually reviewing a um, a special uh, a site plan in addition to that. Um, I don't know if how the ZBA interacts with their decisions. I know through experience with acknowledging how the boards of appeals operate in the, the communities that I've worked in, it's mostly you know variances. If they issue a special permit, maybe they're light on the findings. Um, or the, 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 the procedural aspect of the, the decision, as well as um, any conditions that they may place. So it, it, it really is how it's applied. I, I think that's a great comment. Um, and maybe we, you know, if there's any thoughts to that, you know, the board can share, but uh, maybe we can try to figure out how to address that. Well, a different, a different term, Bill, is there a different legal term? Uh... So well, I'm actually, I'm looking at uh, section nine, which is special permits, uh, just to see what, how it, they. Yeah, I mean, it may be sufficient just to say, instead of finding specific reasons or something like that. Right, just a different term, I think is all we got to exactly. so specify. Any you know, any confusion with the state statute overlapping what we're saying, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we, we just got to avoid that term. That's all. Find, it, find, it, find, find an appropriate term to use in place of it. That's all. That's correct. I agree. But I like what Ken's done. That, that, he's right. I mean, we might, and then you're, you're right, but we got one little paragraph that we hang our hat on and for what we use it for it seems quite a bit inadequate so here's the language the special permit granting authority shall cause to be made a detailed record of its proceedings including the vote of each member upon each question or if absent or failing to vote in such fact and setting forth clearly the reason for its decision <clears throat> and of its official actions. So, um, yeah, we just just use a, use a term that functionally means finding without being the word finding. 
So if you were to apply, uh, if we were to rename that or find another word for that term, would that term appear in your decision with, you know, if, if those are the types of, let's say, reasons or reasonings or the criteria let me um, see what, for let me your see what I use here. Um, so let's just pick site plan approval. I, I use findings and general conditions. Uh, yeah, so I'm using the word findings, um, and I, it's used extensively in in court decisions. Well, it may be okay. Uh, I just. Uh... Well, I, you know, in, in a sense, it is okay because the Z, only the ZBA can make a finding, correct, as a freestanding document or freestanding decision. Anything we do under the special permit bylaw is yeah, it isn't a finding. It can't be a finding as defined by the um, ZBA. Okay. So it can be a, a determination. Or you get synonyms include discovery, location, detection, uncovering, verdict, unearthing. De detection may be a word to use. I like determination. That might be a good one too. Yeah. Probably better than detection. I think the, the, the way I have it, so in this draft, so determination is used as the written determination mm -hmm. for how a special permit is issued here in this version. Okay. Um, no. What we may be able to do is simply define what finding means for this section. Should we sleep on it? Yeah. We can make a decision now. Yeah. So I think what we have uh, what we have to do now is um, I think just let the uh, let town hall know that let the administrator know that we looks like we have two zoning articles that we may want to bring forward the um, special permits and the battery storage. I've got one that I'm working on for, remember we talked about um, putting a section in to give the building inspector the authority to remove signs on public properties that are non-conforming. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been writing something up for him for, to put into the sign section so that he'll have a league, officially have the authority to remove those. Okay. So three. we ask for three. Three. Yeah. Three. Three spaces. Ken, have you looked at what other municipalities are, how they're handling that? With regards to special permits? Yeah. And well, as, as I mentioned, um, you know, this actually came from the work that I did as a town planner. And this is how um, I had approached with my planning board um, special permits because we had established we were working off or in their previous bylaw before, you know, I, I was working with a consultant to um, establish the role and the responsibilities of the planning board through a specific addition to the administration section. Um, special permits are similar to the way that it was that is presented in yours, where it's under the powers of the ZBA. So um, this comes from that. I think I removed a couple of lines 
um, specific to um, the community that I used to work with. Um, and I established that, you know, there usually is some conformity or some consultation with your master plan. And in the, you know, because what would happen during a, a, a public hearing, especially if you're if the the board is aware of the planning documents that you know if the development happens to be in a parcel that may be identified for um, an open space plan as a, as a future you know uh, use for recreation space or whatever I'm not saying that that's gonna you know that that would ne not necessarily happen but um those are the types of the the types of discussions that would be happening in the public hearing. Um, but I think the way that I presented it is that, you know, and I think Bill would agree that maybe this discussion of how to establish a specific section with your administration with just generalities of special permits, also alluding to the various sections of the bylaw, which have some very specific requirements under cannabis or so, uh, solar um, for additional materials that are supposed to be submitted or additional um, conditions or considerations um, that, uh, that are given to, um, with the power of the planning board to condition some of its approvals in those particular sections. This is more general, um, but establishes that, clarifies that the planning board now is, uh, uh, can be a special permit granting authority um, as well as some general, you know, determinations, I think that we may be using that word, those wordings or findings if we can define that. Um, but I would say that a lot of the communities that I've been working with here in the Pioneer Valley, um, at least the three that I currently work with have a specific section for special permits. Um, They've also established rules and response or role, uh, roles and responsibilities of the planning board and their bylaw amendments. So that's something that you know, we can also look at. Okay, thank you. Jenna, did you Jen? Excuse me. Go ahead. Under the special permit section, would we, if we amend it, we wouldn't include everything we have a special permit that we're going to be issuing a permit for that like you got enlisted, right? No, 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 no. Um, it's general <laughs> language. I, that, okay. Yes. Because I think in other, and I, you know, I didn't go to, but my, where I usually look is the solar and cannabis because usually communities work off a model and usually in that model suggests that the planning board serves as a special permit granting authority. Okay. So if that's established within the administration section of that specific bylaw, right. okay. then, yeah. you know, that's the way it's addressed. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't list all of the special permits yeah. and I wouldn't think that the planning board would want to list all this. That just invites conflict with other parts of the bylaw if you're not doing no, those reviews. That's where you have to do including but not limited to. Or that, yeah. I guess if you wanted to present it that way. <laughs> While we mentioned that, and I'm not, I don't want, I don't want you to do any research on it, but, but have you heard or do you know of any big pros or cons on battery storages for solars? It's, um, I was listening to the conversation and I think it's, it, it, it's so unique, especially with the, I agree with, there are not a lot of solar. I, all of the solar has kind of dried up with regards to those applications coming in for your general ground mounted um, solar. A lot of them are coming in for battery, um, and I, um, looking at the the um, the the council um, recommendation that you uh, that Bill um, forwarded to the board, um, it, yeah, I mean, I think I I would agree that the this is uh, a prime time to to start discussing on how to um, look at this particular land use because a lot of communities are, ha are struggling with how to address batteries and i think maybe some determinations for volunteer boards that that are being made are similar to are are they're not taking into consideration those very specific lines that you've drawn upon in 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 your previous meeting um, that i attended um so 
it's obviously you, you're finding a way to clarify that, and I think that's great. And however you you decide to do that, uh, I'll be I'll be following this closely. Um, but I think in in working with the other communities, they're not there yet, and um, you know it, it, it is yeah. It, I don't know, and okay. because there's a big question mark next to battery storage. That's right. So, so essentially, like, yeah. what what Hadley would be doing would be to allowing electricity to be grid at night, right? And now South Hadley and Holyoke have some of the lowest electricity rates in the state because it's all, they're, they're supplying their own electricity. Is there any way we could write into the bylaw that because Hadley is essentially generating electricity, they should have a preferred rate? No. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> That we're not a municipal wholesaler. Well, we're close to it. <laughs> Physically close to it. I, I'm, I'm, just, love, I'm, I'm, I, I'm being. I would I'm, love to be. I'm, able I'm trying to, to make. I'm trying to make. I doubt that it's possible. possible. I'm trying to make. I knew what the answer was going to be, but I tried to. I'm trying to make a point here. Yeah, so Adley, so. Red basket of Hampshire County. We're the commercial district of Hampshire County, and now we're going to be the electricity supplier of Hampshire County. So Ken, uh, any interest? Uh, well, you probably haven't raised it yet, but I'll suggest it. Uh, would PVPC like to uh, develop a um, model bylaw for uh, battery storage? Um, that's a that's a good question, and I, I know that I would have the support at least by of this board to to look at it. I mean, to at least you know spend some time looking at it. Um, it's something that has come up. Uh, you may know, you may not know that we did a solar best practices. I think we were working with um, Dave Nixon. Um, previously, he attended a couple of our working group meetings, but we had 11 communities work on a solar practices best guide, uh, best practice guide for solar um, two years ago um, now. And the battery section, because that did come up in conversation, it was literally the, the technology is too novel and we don't have examples. Um, but now, you know, this is happening across, uh, across the state and we're trying to figure out how to best address it, even just through the, the, the words of your zoning bylaw, but also trying to, to figure out what impacts, what additional protections, you know, the board may want to um, consider. Um, I, I heard him, I heard, um, the, the previous speaker say Southbridge, I'll be calling the, the town plan over there. That's where I used to, to work. Um, he was helping them amend their zoning bylaw for battery yeah, storage. There, there weren't that many towns, you know, yeah. that come off, you know, Southbridge, Lancaster. You know, clearly these, these, the ability to put these things in has a great deal of value to whoever wants to put it in. And the guy also suggested limiting the number of battery storage fields in town. So did, did he say in they, town they, or did he say on a theater branch? I think he said on a branch. On yeah. a branch? Well, yeah. clearly there's going to be a limit to the number that can be put in town. And I think the town should perhaps look at auctioning these rights off. I wonder if our constituents wouldn't want to hear something like, if you're going to put in, if you're going to propose a battery storage without the generation on site, that perhaps it's, you know, it's acceptable or it can be considered in say the industrial zone or, yeah. some, you know, business zone, something. Similar to Which liquor license, there's only going to be a limited amount of these batteries storage fields can go in so we're yeah, yeah. allowing someone to make a lot of money without well, make a lot of what money, the true what, like the, what seeing what the true value to the town is and i think they should we should look at having the select board auction them off once we decide what the bylaw should look like right I, can I, we give the mic to can we give the microphone to, to doc joe Yes, Michael. Uh, it sounds like it was a filibuster there. You're right. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, we're going to tax it. 
And the question is, what kind of tax would it generate? Right. Oh, is that co-generation? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, when it, when it okay. crosses town lines, I think we should ta tax the hell out of it. But if it stays here, you should get a break. Okay, <laughs> okay so Ken, if, if you would get back to us, <clears throat> maybe just drop, me, drop us an email when you get some feedback from your successor. And um, if PVPC has any interest in, um, you, you certainly will have our support if, there's any interest in reviving that uh, working group to take another look at batteries. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it really seems that this is in its infancy and I don't know if Hadley necessarily is opposed to it, but we certainly don't want to be the uh, scapegoat for it either. You don't want to be the poster child for having yeah. it wrong. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And basically getting, as we say in Polish, being... getting it up to Judah. I don't mind being a poster child as long as it has the meat in it to protect the town. We've, we've been a poster, chi poster child on a number of zone issues. And to be honest, we've been very successful at many of them. So we just wanna make sure that wherever we put forward for this, um, it has the right stuff in it. And that's gonna be the, a bit of a, probably the, where the challenge is. So it's got to do that. That's the research we've got to be looking at. We'll do our homework. So, uh, but short term, um, we want to get the special permit polished up as yeah. expeditiously so we can get it uh, on for town meeting. Yes. And we also, uh, as I sent around, I just learned today that uh, we did receive the uh, district local technical LTA? assistance yeah, yeah. for um, $15,000 $15, towards a housing production plan. Yeah, yay. And some guy named Ken Comia is going to be working on it. <laughs> what? I, I'm trying to... Um... Um, because I've been doing a lot of housing work, <laughs> um, see if I could like tag team with, with another housing planner. So, but I will more than likely be working with whoever um, when we establish, um, you know, who those, the, the, the committee will be working with. What exactly is going to be required by the planning board on this bill? Do you know what we applied for, but what, what, is there going to be a, a separate committee or is it going to be the planning board and Ken again? Uh, I think I, I did the application on the behalf of the planning board. Okay. So um, to gather, if, because that was the requirement, the application had to come from either the planning board or the select board. Okay. Um, I didn't propose setting up another committee. Um, That's good. I That's think good. that uh, since we're also the trustees of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, plus uh, David, Phil, and uh, Danley. Uh, there's also the uh, Housing and Economic Development Committee that Molly Keegan chairs that I participate in. Um, was so I, I think we can get input from several directions without creating a subcommittee. Good. And going forward, looking at our... Um, what we have on our schedule, we, we're fairly light, uh, you know, apart from the battery storage, I don't think we have any other projects pending. So I think we'll have enough time to kick this along as much as it needs to be kicked along. Good. Okay, and, what are the, the top five variables that would be looked at in something like this, the housing production plan? Or is that the wrong, even wrong approach? What are what are the variables we're looking at? Well, I the way that I've approached it is Hadley doesn't, right? You don't have a housing production plan, right? Is that it's it's no, I don't think we do. No, we do um, not have a housing production plan. We have a housing chapter in the uh, master plan. So I I think the, the, first, the first way that I would approach the project is because the community hasn't had a housing production plan is to 
do the deep dive into the housing master plan chapter, but also with the board, because it sounds as if this is the committee with the input from the other, other committees or other um, individuals, um, look at, and I'll say this for another meeting, um, but there are very specific things that need to be present in this housing production plan. It's the housing analysis, looking at a snap, snapshot of your demographics, as well as um, the housing market and some census data on housing units, the age of units, whatnot. Um, and then looking at constraints to development in Hadley, looking at your zoning, looking at some environmental constraints. Usually that, that information would be coming from an open space plan or your open space and open space and recreation chapter of your master plan. Um, to, to help inform that discussion. Um, what, all, what also needs to happen is in order to comply with DHCD, which is the uh, approval, um, the body that will approve this housing production plan, is that you have to have a plan to increase or maintain housing, right? As you know, you are a community with over 10%, um, and you are making you are making strides at maintaining that, if not increasing that number. Um, you've established and are working towards um, how to use um, CPA funds among other funds in your inclusionary zoning bylaw to um, put some money in the affordable housing trust fund, how you're gonna expend those monies and, and learn about that process. Um, but, you know, it, I, I can't say that there are any variables because I don't know, um, you know, every, every community is different on how they approach this plan. This is the first community that I'm working with that has over 10%. Um, how, do you, how do you navigate the understanding that you are over 10% and in the next five years, because these have a lifeline of five years, you'll probably still be in the 10%. Um, your numbers will change because of the new census data. Um, so I don't know, you know, what will, what has happened between 2010 and 2020 uh, with regards to the increase of housing production. Um, did any new, did any new units go into the subsidized housing inventory? What has your process been to put those into the subsidized housing inventory to either increase those numbers? Are they going to stay the same? Um, once DHCD issues your, your new subsidized housing inventory, um, how will we address that? Um, but I think, you know, we'll save that, that presentation of what housing production plan and, and all those other requirements for, you know, a future meeting. Um, but I, yeah, I, I can't really say, you know, I think it's still too well, early. You to know, one of the demands for Hadley housing is it's UMass students, sure. as Dr. Zagranik's point pointed out many times. You, you, you know, houses have been built specifically to rent to students, and we got to look at that aspect because it kind of skews the data. It, exactly, it makes housing much more affordable because when you see the last five houses that went up are now student stuffers, and you're not going to get a middle class people competing with seven or eight students in a house. Uh, so that really skews it. And when they look at the master plan, I hate when people start cherry picking to item number 14 or 15 on the master plan, plan list. The number one criteria that people choose why they want to live in Hadley is because of the agricultural open space concept. So we don't want to eat up all our good farmland to put more housing which the University of Massachusetts has abdicated their responsibility for housing their own students. So those are my editorial comments. In the oh, they're great comments. That's right. Okay. That's right. Let, that's yes, that's right. enough of this. Yes. So, yeah, can, we'll, we'll, we'll take this up at a future meeting in much more detail as opposed to, you know, just, just to mention that we do have the grant approved for 15000 and also the... Uh, Zoom has been continued from April to what, middle of Ju July, Bill? July 15th. So wow. that's good news. We can continue with our Zoom meetings for at least four more months.
So uh, can the Conservation Commission, I think, does have an open space plan, or they've, they've been working on the open space plan, so you can talk to them on that. And there is a specific development constraints appendix map to the master plan. Right. Yeah, that'll be very helpful. Um, you know, I think with, as we take inventory of your town documents, um, just taking note of those, especially if they've been updated recently, that'll be very helpful in the, the drafting of this. Um, you know, just another comment is that there's going to be some sort of, uh, we need to have a, a community survey and a community, some community engagement workshop. Um, so how that, however that happens, um, you know, if you are, the, if the planning board wants to explore something, especially in the summer months, um, maybe a second workshop or in the fall months, a second workshop that's in person, um, that could be something. If, if maybe the first one is virtual, um, just because we, I think we seem to have um, some time on our hands, at least for a few months or two, maybe two months um, while we work on these bylaw amendments, as well as any forthcoming applications. But so the tax collector has been willing to piggyback um, a brief um, reminder to log in for an online questionnaire or something like that in the tax bills. The, there's a tax bill going out almost all the time, but the, um, okay. the real estate bills go out quarterly as do the water bills. Um, as do, and the, the auto excise goes out once a year. So um, there, there's a possibility for piggybacking something in there, but uh, we have to check with the tax collector about what the time, uh, what the lead times are for that. Okay. That's a good way to read The uh, last water bill just came out a few weeks ago. So we've got a, the next one probably won't be out until probably uh, May. I think that's great. I think that's good timing um, yeah, the, to send out a you know a reminder for a survey. Um, maybe you know we can, uh, we, can work, next, we can work on those timelines. The next tax bill should be mailed uh, April first to uh, May first, so that's probably a little tight. Uh, one after that will be July uh, July 1st to uh, August 1st. Okay. That's a doable. Okay, do you have any experience in encouraging developers to hop on board with a friendly 40B? Um, I've only interacted with one. I, I normally am not part of those conversations. So... Uh -huh. Um, when I was in Southbridge, we had a relatively friendly 40B. Um, they came in knowing that they had all of these tax credits that they wanted to um, utilize and, and maneuver through those processes. I know that in working with the ZBA, because they were the ones that had to oversee the comprehensive permit, um, you know, I think it was a pretty decent process. I know the planning board some members of the planning board were not as um, happy or, um, you know, with regard to that particular developer. I think that, you know, that particular development was, um, there, there were just lots of different perspectives in that particular developer who wanted to develop um, 48 units um, in an old mill building. Um, but those conversations were happening with the planning department, with other town officials, and um, I think, you know, there were some concessions by the developer to get it to something that more that matched more um, our subsidized housing inventory and, and increasing those numbers. This is taxes on a local level, a town level you're talking about. Yeah, I know that there were some um, incentives that the town council had um, allowed for him, but I don't think they were related to the, the housing um, the housing uh, component. It was a large, it was the American Optical 
Girl. complex in Southbridge and um, there were so many other types of development opportunities in that complex. So he was coming to the council for, you know, tiffs and diffs and all of those uh, various incentives to get some of that development up. Or just a suggestion, but if, you know, if the state really wants to encourage affordable housing, they should look at giving developers a tax break at the state level, state income tax level. And okay. That would help it and it would take the onus off the town having to give the tax right. break. Okay, so something. To so in fact, we don't give any tax breaks. We've never had to. I think we may even have oh, to get okay. them adopted by town meeting. Um, mm -hmm. We just haven't opted into any of those programs. Okay. We're the. I think what Ken is talking about it, it um, maybe uh, tax credits to the developer for putting up affordable housing, and uh, that do come off of federal and state income i think there are also and i think that's the issue with uh, uh the housing over um at the amherst line uh, the uh, the one on behind pride which has recently right. changed hands um they're um i think they got some uh very favorable financing terms from the state for putting up affordable and keeping it affordable for a period of time. Ken, is AO still in Southbridge? Yeah. Well, they are. Yeah, I mean, they're not operating. I mean, no, the company is not still in operation, but the complex still retains the name and, you know, the residents all refer to that, the complex as AO. Um, but I don't think there's any sort of remnants of that operation there. I look forward to working with the board on this. I This might be, um, it, I think the board will have to determine whether or not these conversations, especially related to um, either findings that as we continue to discuss housing um, can happen within the planning board meeting. I know that in working with planning boards that are working as the committee also doing a housing production plan, and maybe you have experience with other PVPC staff. I've never, you know, this is the first time that I'm working with a board also on a plan. Um, so I don't know if, you know, there is, um, time outside of the planning board meeting where something a conversation specific to housing would be favorable. Um, but I think we can cross that bridge when we need to um, because we should be having also routine meetings just to discuss the progression of the plan and, and how drafts um, are, you know, um, how you review them um, as we continue to work on them. Ken, I don't have real heartburn over the word planning. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that it did not interfere with the traditional wording of planning from the state bylaw. So um, if it, if Bill and you figure it's not going to interfere in any way, shape or form that I'm fine with it. So. So we, we, at least until July 15th, unless it gets moved again, have the ability to uh, bring a meeting together um, pretty much any time by Zoom. Uh, obviously, there's some posting requirements if more than two of us participate at any one time. Uh, but I suppose there could also be, uh, you know, we could put together something that might bring in uh, the other two people on the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and from the uh, Housing and Economic Development Group have a little summit meeting of that core group. Um, now I can set that up on, you know, obviously it still needs the three days notice because it would be three separate entities meeting. Um, but I think we can set that up pretty easily. It's probably a good way to kick off the focus on the housing production plan. Right. Is Christian Stanley still a trustee? He is still a trustee. 
the only requirement is that a member of the select board be a trustee and David Phil is filling that role. So Christian is a community member at the moment. He's also the chairman of the, of the group. Of which group? Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Affordable Housing. Oh, okay. Um, okay. okay. So I have a couple of other odds and ends. Thanks, Jen. Oh, next <laughs> meeting with Mr. Cormier. Oh. We could do the first or the third, either March 1 or, 8 or March 15, whichever one's better for you, Ken. Um, the Ides in March. <laughs> 15th would be good for me. I'm not going to be here on the first. I don't know if I can dial in or not. But Okay. At two, Michael? <laughs> At two, Brute. <laughs> At two, Michael. I think that should be fine the 15th with regards to, I, I don't know if that impedes on, on your plans for zoning bylaw amendments and the other ones, um, because obviously, you know, you're, we're working on the special permit section, but I don't know if you would be having any other discussion with your other ones that you're looking at. Uh, if you could possibly get us revised language for the special permit, maybe the rest of us can talk about it on the first. I'll do that. Yeah. I may have to. Oops. Get it in by midnight on Friday, though. Yeah. The 15th <laughs> might be good to kick off this uh, housing, housing thing as well, because we don't, we don't have much going on. We probably won't have much for that meeting. Right. Be, work on uh, something for that. I think that I think that's a good idea. Um, that will give me time to at least formulate um, what that agenda item would look like. Probably present. Um, it will be a, a formal kickoff to the project. That's the night of the continuation of the gravel pit uh, battery, right? Right, but I suspect that they will uh have no they, they have no reason to object to a continuation until after town meeting yeah i mean right. and that guy seems to be a useful resource for um what we're talking about right so special permit reasons by three one and um and for, for 315 we'll talk about special permit and um, battery. And possibly kick off the housing plan, right? Oh, that yes. Would be, I think that would be good. Housing production plans, uh, yeah. So I missed uh, Christian Stanley being put on the was that that must have been at a select board meeting that they that, that, that was at our first meeting of the affordable housing trust fund and Christian Stanley and Dave Phil were on that the selectman did appoint him to that committee and the committee appointed Christian Stanley as chairman of the housing trust fund and Mr. Dwyer as clerk that correct that was a, yes. that was a special meeting other than a planning board meeting oh. that is correct but, well no the the uh, trustees are appointed by the select board mm -hmm. so we, the five of us christian stanley and david phil were appointed as trustees at a meeting of the select board right then we subsequently had a meeting of the affordable housing trust fund at which we appointed as, as jim said Christian is president or uh, chair and uh, me as clerk. And then we went into a quick vote on the uh, advancing money to the rental assistance fund. 
and then nothing was drawn from that so that has been rescinded or it died automatically um and we have not met since then we probably should have a meeting but um there is technically the requirement is there has to be a member of the select board there has to be a member of the planning board and all of the other members can be at large of the affordable housing trust fund um so that's how we got to where we are i must have missed the invite to that one i believe you were there really i thought you were there too i yeah. don't remember christian stanley hmm. Maybe this is what happens when I turn 60. Just <laughs> Will you turn um, a lot of the rest of us? I want to be 60 again. Uh, well, now I see why. Uh, I logged you in at 5.55. The meeting started at 5.30. Oh, so sorry. the actual organizational portion of it um, that was what we took up as the first item. Okay. What was that date? Uh, December 8th of 20. <laughs> 21? 20. 21, right? 12, 8, 20. Oh, 12, 8, 20. Oh, oh yes. Okay. 12, 8, 20? Yep. That's... We're supposed to have a meeting a year. Yes, so uh, I will make a note to uh, schedule. Our 2021 meeting. Wonder I didn't remember. Mr. Short-term memory. Oh, Mr. Stanley, you should be scheduling a meeting once a year. So that actually it would be, I don't want to pile too much onto the 15th, but if we schedule, if we uh, post for a meeting for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund for the 15th, we can get, knock that out of the, check that off too. I think that's too much. I think if you're going to if you're going to schedule a meeting for the housing trust fund, do it for the first for February for March first bill. Okay. Because uh, depending how much we get talking with Ken and special and the other special permits and the other stuff, um, that's going to make a extremely buried meeting on a fifteenth. Okay. So I will post for a simultaneous meeting of the planning board and a meeting for the affordable housing trust fund for March 1. That would be good. Thank you. That was December 8th. So that would have been a second Tuesday instead of a first. So it was not a planning board night. It was not a planning board night. Mm. It's, and that's probably why you were late because you had something else yeah I probably had to be reminded it was off my grid it was probably my piano lesson night <laughs> okay oh, is the select what would have a meeting on the first bill um uh, yeah, they do probably, but they're probably not meeting until uh, hmm. that means David can won't make it right. Um, okay, well, I made a note to schedule the meeting. Let me, um, yeah, that'd be the same thing with the fifth. Yeah, any Wednesday. No, the first is a Tuesday. Yeah. Oh. Right. Okay. The first is a, oh, the, right. That's right. That's a Tuesday. I'm sorry. You're right. 
That, that would be all right. Jim okay. just turned 60. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Ken. Yes. You're always Mark's enlightening us. We're, we're going to be seeing a lot of Mr. Ken this year. Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So I do have one more, two more things. Uh, one involves Ken sort of indirectly. Um, I got a uh, letter from PVPC uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, talking about uh, the Joint Transportation Committee, which is how we parse out uh, federal funds for highway projects in Massachusetts. And I noticed that it had uh, Christian and... Uh, and Chris Okafer as the town's representative to the Joint Transportation Committee. Um, and uh, I guess neither of them have been going. And of course, Chris Okafer is no longer with the town. So uh, I volunteered since I have been involved with PVPC for so long, and I at least know what the, all the acronyms mean um, to be the town representative for to uh, Joint Transportation Committee and uh, the acting DPW director is going to be the alternate representative to the Transportation Joint Transportation Committee. Um, so that that's going to appointment is going to go through tomorrow at, on the consent agenda at the select board meeting. So I just passed that along. Um, it's. Um, part of a, an extensive planning process. So it's not like it's going, going to turn on the spigot for uh, federal highway dollars. Uh, but we have a couple of projects that would probably be eligible for that. They just have to get in line. <clears throat> we are finding that the state's actually spending a lot of money in Hadley, but it's not directly going to Hadley roads. They're uh, having a lot of fun rebuilding Route 9 and. Uh, so all, uh, somebody has to just be there occasionally to remind them that that's just because the money's being spent in Hadley, it's not Hadley that is the sole beneficiary. So I pass that along for what it's worth. Good. And I think I also gave everybody a, uh, an email about the drainage problem on Adair Place. Yes. Yes. So um, that's... That's just an open item. Um, the um, were they looking in to see if that was a backed up pipe or yes, but they can't do it now. So it's uh, it's going to be a spring project. Uh, they're going to have to uh, find someone who can uh, uh, video the pipe and see what's in there. Fletcher drain. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, they're. Uh, Apparently it's a, it's a specialty area and there, there was one person, here, here's an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial opportunity for all you retirees. There's, a, there's one guy who uh, had a specialty in doing this uh, small job, a bore inspection, I guess. Um, and uh, he's not doing it anymore. So if you're, the town has to, um, wants to get anything done, they have to contract with someone who is going to charge them for four hours of travel time and like to, so uh, there, there's- Fletcher a, Drain, uh, Fletcher Drain and uh, Chicopee can do it reasonably priced. Yeah, we use them on campus all the time. Yeah. Okay. If you I'll need a that. plumbing colonoscopy. Uh, okay. So uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, definitely- it's anybody, who, anybody who can look up a sewer pipe can look at this pipe. <laughs> okay, yeah, it is just a, a drain. Um, so I think that is all that I have. I have nothing else. Well, I just want to thank uh, Mr. Dwyer for taking on that other, um, you know, putting on one more hat. I'm, and thank you to the town treasurer for approving that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was a very nice letter that you wrote to the uh, Senate to the uh, Senate to Comerford about the yeah. uh, for the yeah. Zoom stuff. That were that was very nice. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad it, uh, I sent the uh, I 
follow-up email today from her uh, one of her uh, staff that the governor has um, has signed the bill now, and yeah. uh, and that they re were receiving similar comments from many communities. Yeah, I, I've got to believe that we aren't alone in attendance being grossly better. I mean, could you just look, tonight, it's cold outside tonight, cold and windy. And here we are, we're all sitting nice and warm in our own little houses, not having to freeze our butts off, go out into the cold. <laughs> That's very convenient. Yep. The loser is Joe's Pizza. Oh, no, I, you guys oh, we're still going get there. there. We're going, let's, yeah. I, I make a motion to adjourn so Zeke and I can go to Joe's. <laughs> I'll that motion. <laughs> Um, anybody else have anything? No? Motion to adjourn? So moved. And seconded. And a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We'll see you. Aye. Ken's opposed. Good night. Media Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ken. Good night. And see you in two weeks. Good night.